book in the offering plate that'll get to us, or you can see me after worship today. Let's take a quick look at our church announcements and calendar. You'll see the information about the dates for the sandwich sale. Uh, also, there's be no Bible this week, as I will be on. I'm going to stand in one place. It keeps cutting out. Um, there will be no Bible study this week, as I will be on vacation. Uh, now through next Sunday. Next Sunday, Nancy Musso, who's a lay servant, will be here uh, to lead you through worship. Uh, and so I hope you'll give her a, a warm welcome as she brings a message to you. Uh, for our Bible study the following week, uh, we'll be looking at chapter 2 of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, so Ephesians chapter 2. You'll see all the other uh, information listed in there. Um, I have to say I enjoyed the pasties very much. There's still some left. I, we still has, have some left. So we didn't eat all six yesterday. Just two. <laughs> Just two. Um, but we're, we're very good and want to thank everybody who put that effort in together for the church. Some of the proceeds will be going to UMCOR for hurricane relief. So again, thank you for uh, your generous uh, donations if you have given already and, and for purchasing those pasties. Uh, again, the last piece I want to mention is the Equipping God's People module uh, being taught in October by myself and Bill Bachman, who's a member of Trucksville. So if you have an opportunity to take that, I encourage it. And the information about that class is there. Are there any other announcements we need to put forward today? Scanning, scanning. Not seeing any? Then why don't I say this to you? The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Would you turn and greet one another with signs of peace and love in the name of Jesus today? Let's now focus our minds on worshiping God by listening to the prelude. Would you please join me in the call to worship? Sing to God for mercy and grace. For our God is mighty and strong, protecting the lowly from the anger of the oppressor. Our God is righteous and just, saving the weak from the world's hidden power. Sing to God for mercy and grace. We'll be singing uh, hymn number 560 in your hymnals.
Now we'll have the opening prayer. The Lord be with you. God, our source of salvation, in love you made us, and by love you have redeemed us. Make your love for us bear fruit in our forgiveness of others, that in this life we may know your unbracing compassion, and in the world to come receive the everlasting joy of fellowship you share with your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Please join me in the prayer of illumination. You may be seated. Holy Spirit, as your word is read and preached, pass among us your gathered people, opening minds to increase understanding, opening hearts to bind us together in your love. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'm reading from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own God that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in the honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so he may be, be Lord of both the dead and the living. Who do you pass judgment on, your brother or sister, or you? Who do you despise, your brother or sister? For we all stand before judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to the Lord. So then each of us will be accountable to God. This is the word of the Lord.
Let's stand together and join in our next hymn, My Hope is Built, number 368. You remain standing if you're comfortable standing as we hear together the gospel message today. At that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Jesus replied, seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. The kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. He got underway. One servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. He couldn't pay up, so the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him ten dollars. He seized him by the throat and demanded, Pay up now! The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. But he wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put him in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, you evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. And that's exactly what my Father in Heaven is going to do to each of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated.
Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's children said, Amen. You've heard the stories before, I know you have. Debbie and someone else lose 30 pounds. Brooke sheds 95 pounds and you hear her testimony that says the mirror is not my enemy anymore. Margaret losing 35 pounds, three dress sizes, and 10% body fat. Those are just a few of probably thousands of testimonies that could be cited for the benefits of hiring a personal trainer. These people came to a point in their lives in which they felt their weight and overall health and fitness was not good and spiraling out of control. So a personal trainer they paid to help stop that spiraling out of control. Writing in Men's Journal, Lauren Steele says that working out with her personal trainer increases her fitness goal success rate by 30%. According to a study published in the Journal of Sports Science and Medicine, the study found that the influence of direct supervision during workouts had a huge effect on the outcome of training. Given the obesity problem in the United States and the lack of general fitness, the American fitness industry is now more than a $5 billion business when it comes to gym subscriptions and memberships. $5 billion. At these gyms, many clients train, but then they decide they need something more. So they hire a personal trainer to actively get involved with them to help them get in shape. What does a personal trainer do? Well, a reputable and qualified personal trainer has a varying degree of knowledge about exercise and instruction. He or she will motivate their clients by setting goals, providing feedback, and holding them accountable to stay on target. Trainers also measure their clients' strengths and weaknesses with fitness assessments, usually assessing before they start the program and at different points of the program and then at the completion. They also provide education about general health, about diet, about nutrition. Now if we think about that just for a little bit, physical training and a personal trainer, now start thinking about spiritual training. If we want to be spiritually fit, who would we want as our fitness trainer? I know we have mentors who have helped us out through the faith. There are pastors. There are trusted friends. All of them could fall in that category of a a spiritual fitness trainer. But there isn't anyone that's better at doing that kind of training than Jesus. And what we hear today from the gospel message is something he specializes in. Forgiveness fitness. But does forgiveness fitness really work? Well, think about this story. Scarlett Lewis lost her six-year-old son, Jesse, in the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. He was one of 20 children that were killed that day in that horrific attack in 2012. An absolute nightmare that came to life. Parents such as Scarlett were devastated. At first, her anger sapped all of her energy and strength. Her rage was directed at the shooter and also at the mother who had unwittingly armed this young man. But then she made a choice. She made a choice to forgive. She says, forgiveness felt like I was given a big pair of scissors, and these scissors helped me to cut out the shooter and regain my personal power back. Again, she says it started with a choice and then became a process. At her son's funeral, she urged mourners to change their angry thoughts into loving ones. She saw this shift as a way that they all not only could change the community, but change the world. Forgiveness starts with making the choice to forgive And then becomes a process as you learn how to do it over and over again. Jesus urges us to make this choice for ourselves when he responds to Peter's question. And notice in Eugene Peterson's The Message, which is what I read from, 
what it says about Peter. It says, at that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask. How often does it take us a while to get the nerve to speak to God or Christ? That we lose our nerve to ask. But clearly, Peter got up the nerve. So, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Well, you kind of know that Jesus is going to use Peter's question as a foil for a story. He's going to come back at him. Seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. Other versions may say 77 times. In Eugene Peterson's The Message, the one I read, the count actually comes up to 490 times. Kind of a ridiculous amount. But however you count it, Jesus is saying to you and I, forgiveness should be countless, limitless, numberless. Like a personal trainer at the gym, Jesus is urging you and I to do our reps, our repetitions of forgiveness to get stronger each and every day. One, two, three, four, all the way up to 490 if necessary. Jesus is the forgiveness trainer. He's saying forgive a whole bunch of times. And a whole bunch you might think is two or three, but he's saying no. Limitless. Again and again you are to do it. Make the choice. Forgive. And then do it in such a way that you're learning and growing to do it again and again. Why does Jesus tell us this? Forgiving the people who hurt us can be a hard thing to do. Much tougher than lifting a stack of weights at the gym. But he recommends it because forgiveness is good for the faith. Not just for the person who needs to be forgiven, but for us. Forgiveness can enable you to regain your personal power, continue your faith journey just as it did for Scarlett Lewis. Many people do things and they're unforgiving. They'll never forgive. And then there are people who fail to forgive, who refuse to do it. And then Jesus tells this story based off of Peter's question. There's this servant, let's call him Bernie, and he owes his boss $100,000. Couldn't come up with the cash, so the boss orders him to be sold he, his wife, and all of his possessions to get back what's owed him. Now, in those days, it was legal for a boss to do that. Well, Bernie throws himself on the ground looking for mercy, begging to be given one more time to try and pay it all off. And the boss has pity on him, telling his men to release Bernie and forgives the whole entire debt. Happy ending, right? Not so fast. Bernie leaves the boss's house. He sees another servant who owes him $10. Grabs the guy, let's call him George. Grabs him by the throat and says, George, pay me what you owe me. George hits his knees. The story sound familiar? Begs Bernie for more time to settle that debt of $10. But Bernie says, absolutely not. And has George thrown in prison until he can pay it. Although Bernie's been forgiven a debt of $100,000, he cannot find it in his heart to go easy on George over just a couple of bucks. I think it's pretty clear he needs some forgiveness training. When Bernie's fellow servants see and hear what's happening, they're just horrified by it all. They go back to the boss and give a detailed report and after they've reported what they saw, the boss summons Bernie and asks them, should you not have had mercy on George as I had mercy on you? Oops. Bernie's been busted. The boss doesn't have any patience with him at all. And then Jesus said, that's exactly what my Father in Heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone, anyone who asks for mercy. 
If you think a fitness coach standing over you trying to do reps with a weight is tough, Jesus is tougher standing over you as your forgiveness trainer, demanding that you forgive other people. And it's based on one particular fact, that we all have been forgiven by him. He insists that we make that choice to forgive day after day after day and turn it into a process that makes all of us stronger. Stronger. Forgiveness has benefits. Modern research is discovering that Jesus was right about the benefits of forgiving one another. Dr. Robert Enright is a developmental psychologist in Wisconsin and also a believer in Jesus Christ who's raised on those teachings of tolerance and forgiveness. But he wondered if forgiveness could be proven to help patients in a hospital or a a clinic setting. So he designed ways to include forgiveness in therapy sessions, and he studied its effects. He developed therapies for helping elderly women to forgive the people who had wronged them in the past. He also tried to help the victims of abuse and incest to understand the people who assaulted them without justifying what the abusers did. He created these two groups, one made up of women undergoing forgiveness therapy, and one made up of women just simply receiving therapy for emotional wounds without forgiveness. What did he find out? That the forgiveness therapy group showed greater improvement in emotional and psychological health than the group that did not focus on forgiveness. As Scarlett Lewis discovered after the Sandy Hook attack, forgiveness helps people to regain their personal power and drive. You may remember over 10 years ago on October 2nd, a gunman broke into an Amish schoolhouse, proceeded to shoot and kill several young girls and then turned the gun on himself. A horrible, evil tragedy. But the Amish community not only honored and buried their daughters, the families then offered their condolences and forgiveness to the shooter's widow and children left behind by what happened. More than half of those who attended the shooter's funeral were members of the Amish community. Even as they offered their condolences to the widow and her children. They offered the family a portion of the offerings that had poured into their community in memory of their children. The Amish did not condone the evilness of that act, but they shared their forgiveness and poured it out from their hurting community. Let's try this. So as I was saying, the Amish community never condoned that evil act. But the forgiveness poured out from a hurting community to a hurting family was absolute. You may remember another story. And I only need to say her first name, Malala. The 14-year-old Pakistani advocate for girls to receive an education that was targeted by the Taliban. She was shot by a would-be assassin on her school bus on October 9th of 2012. Miraculously, she survived and she continued her fearless, outspoken commitment for the education rights for girls and boys all over the world. After recovering from her wound, Malala made the media rounds talking to people about what happened to her, 
but she kept the focus always on education, never on revenge. When interviewed by John Stewart, who used to host The Daily Show, she managed to leave him speechless. She declared that if attacked again by the Taliban assassin, she would not physically defend herself, but would instead try to talk to them about the need for education. She choked that she might try to throw her shoe at the attacker, but then she took it back and said, if you hit a Taliban with a shoe, there will be no difference between you and the Taliban. She forgives not the violent actions, she wasn't forgiving that. But what she did forgive was their ignorance. And she continues to dedicate her life to bringing the light of education into that dark world. She said, you might fight others, you must fight others, but through peace and through dialogue and through education. If that's not 70 times 7, I don't know what is. We're called to make a choice. Jesus wants us to get stronger and healthier by making the decision to forgive and then turning that choice into a process. He is our forgiveness trainer, challenging us to make that choice repeatedly until it becomes part of our DNA. I know forgiveness is difficult. Seeing ourselves as sinners who have received forgiveness from our loving Lord is also difficult. Time and again, I hear, well, I'm not really a sinner. I've heard from AA and NA groups that have told me that they are recovering. They're recovering alcoholics, recovering addicts, recovering... My friends, we are recovering sinners. We've come to the place to talk about it. To remind ourselves to not continue to do it, but to live in a different way. I know it's much easier to hold grudges than to feel compassion toward the people who have hurt us. But Jesus knows that forgiveness is good for us, body, mind, spirit, and faith. Which is why he commends us and commands us to offer it to our brothers and sisters. When I say brothers and sisters, I'm not just talking about people who believe in Jesus. I'm talking about everybody. Sometimes we need to be challenged to forgive just as we need to be pushed by our trainers at the gym to do repetitions of exercises over and over and over again. Everyone within the sound of my voice needs to forgive someone this week. It may be yourself. Maybe you've done something you're not proud of. Can you forgive yourself? It may be a family member with whom you've nursed an unforgiving grudge for years. Can you forgive that family member? Can you forgive your enemies? It may be an enemy, enemy that is doing everything they can to make you fail. You're called to forgive. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our trespasses. Sometimes we say, forgive us our debts. The closer translation of the word is sin. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive. We can't just say it and not do it. In the Lord's Prayer, we say it daily. Forgiveness is withheld from the person who won't forgive, not because God is punishing us for not forgiving, but because the person who won't forgive can't receive the forgiveness. We're called to forgive. Forgiveness, often we tie to the behavior. So, well, I can't forgive what they did. You're not being asked to forgive the behavior. Just like the Amish weren't asked to forgive what happened. They're called to forgive the person. And signs of forgiveness and grace were shown to that wife and family. Malala doesn't forgive what happened to her she forgives the fact that they're ignorant of what happened. They need education, she says, girls and boys together, so that this does not happen again. We're all called.
called to forgive. It is not an easy thing to do. But we do it because it's already been done for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, every time we have communion, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We say those words, they ought to have more weight. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Whoever it is this week, now you are called to forgive. And it's not some magic number. Jesus says 70 times 7. But that's a huge number. In other words, we're supposed to keep doing it. It helps us regain our personal power and faith and continues in the process that will strengthen who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. Go and forgive. Amen. As we come together as God's children, we're called upon to pray for one another. Are there joys or concerns we need to share with the body this morning? Anyone? Yes. I'm praying for uh, Lexi, a little girl who has Rett syndrome. It's pretty rare, but uh, she has it, and she's down in the Geisinger Hospital right now. Others? Catherine Bannon and the entire Bannon family. Any others? I ask you to pray for Tommy uh, this week. Um, he is going to a hearing this week regarding his disability. I also ask you to pray for Kathy's sister Pat and her husband Tom. Uh, as she just got a call a little, go, a little while ago about Pat being in the hospital. So for, for Pat and for Tom, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty, powerful, caring, and merciful God, you have rescued your people in the past and you continue to rescue today. So we who have been saved time and again gather here to sing to you in your glorious triumph. Your enduring mercy calls to mind that we do not always treat others with that same generosity. We demand that we be forgiven by others without ceasing, but we often keep accounts of our own charity. We demand forbearance from our brothers and sisters, but we have short tempers when we're offended. We forget that all things and matters and accounts are in your hand. And we have received far more from you than we can even count. Forgive us our ingratitude. Wipe clean the accounts of our sin and have mercy upon us once more. Increase our vision by filling us with the Holy Spirit that we might see that we are not called to love and serve you in the same way. Each of us has different gifts. Help us to uphold one another and commit all our doings to the fulfilling of your purposes. You led and gave direction to your wandering children in the desert. You saved them from the pursuers by opening up the sea. So open now the floodgates of your compassion and mercy and teach those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Visit the lonely, give peace to those who are in trouble, and comfort those who mourn. Hear our prayers today for Lexi, for Pat and Tom, 
for Frank, for Jimmy, the Slutkowski family, for Mike and Allie, for Tommy, for Dan, for Ben and Joe and Stacy, for Catherine Bannon and her family. We ask you to be with the people of Texas and Louisiana who continue to recover from Hurricane Harvey. We hear today that more people are being allowed home in Florida and other areas who suffered from Hurricane Irma. Be with all of them. May the people who have come to offer their hands and help keep their hopes alive to allow them to rebuild and not lose that hope and strength. We lift up those out west who are suffering from the wildfires and the firefighters who are fighting those fires. We ask you to be with those who suffer addictions, who are recovering, and those who are trying to keep them on the path. We ask you to be with those people whose depression and circumstances push them to believe the only way is suicide. Help us to be a part of the solution, to reach out the hand, to reach out, to tell them, I'm here to listen to what you have to say. We ask you to be with our EMS and fire and police, folks who work in the hospitals, who continue to do their job, some of which is at great risk to their own lives. We thank you for those people, and we are blessed to have them serving our communities. And on this day, may we take a moment, wherever we are, on this National Thank a Police Officer Day, to say thank you to those who keep us safe. And even while we do that, we know there is unrest in St. Louis, the unrest over a verdict, and those who continue to shout. Help us to hear them, Lord. Help us to hear that we are not equal, that there is so much hate and hurt out there that continues to divide. Help us to reach out our hands to one another, to let people know we will not let hate win. We ask you to be with folks around the world, countries that were affected by the recent monsoon, for Syria and Iraq, for Afghanistan. And again, we hear the world is tense over North Korea. Lord, may the world, not just one or two countries, may the world come together and say this is not acceptable. To find a peaceful solution. And lastly, we ask you to be with our military and their families wherever they may be serving. We have learned forgiveness from your son, our forgiveness trainer. Help us to continually make the choice each and every day of our lives that we forgive, knowing that forgiveness is good for the body, mind, soul, and faith. And as we do it, help us to be stronger in that faith so that we might share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Hear us now as we offer our praise and our petitions and our thanksgiving. For we pray it all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father. As God has offered us so many gifts, it's now we offer some of them back to the church, so the church may be a gift and a blessing to others.
Let's join together in our prayer of dedication. As you go forth today, forgive. Let Jesus be your forgiveness trainer. I know it is not easy. I had two conversations at Dallas before I came here. How do I do that? It's not easy. But remember, you have to take the act and the behavior out of the question. It's about the person saying, I forgive you. I don't like what you did, but I forgive you and I love you. You are my brother, you are my sister. Forgive. And not just once. Do it again and again. And as you get in the practice of it, more and more of it will happen. People might look at you and say, why did you do that? We could say the same thing about the story, but forgive. Jesus did it for you and I. He died for us. All of our sins forgiven. We're called to forgive as part of who we are as his disciples. Go now in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.